Good morning, good morning. A little bit overcast today, I think. Sun should be coming out soon. It might actually be out, I can't tell. It's a light haze up there today. No rain in the forecast. A little bit chilly. You can see the people are wearing. Nobody's in shirt sleeves anymore. Although yesterday afternoon was warm again. Good morning, good morning. A nice floater. The guy's about to hit it there. Whoop! Oh, what happened? <laughs> it was a one kegger, I guess, at the uh, oyster shack next door over the last couple of days. Although, actually, no, he had, uh, he had two of those out there yesterday, so they're doing good business now towards the end of the year. Let's pull it down a bit. Good morning, good morning. Little, little tiny bit of chaos here. I came here about a half an hour ago to get set up and uh, I realized, of course, for the test, we've been doing testing. Taran San and I have been testing, getting ready for the upcoming uh, live stream, start to finish print. And of course, we moved different cameras around and different benches around and I didn't have a good grasp of what was happening. I set up a new scene, what's called a scene in the broadcaster software, used the different cameras in it, changed their settings. And when I came back to our normal scene just now, everything's also changed. I didn't think that was happening. I thought the different scenes were independent, but they're not. They're, they're tied together quite a lot. So. so it took me a bunch of time to rearrange this morning. For those of you who are worried about one thing, you know, I've been touching the computer sometimes and it knocks out one of the cameras and we're worried about that happening during our live broadcast, during the, the long live broadcast next week. And so I've, I've got some new stuff. We have new gear here. New gear, a new interface. The cameras you're seeing now are going through a new interface, which I think... Looks to be a lot more stable than the stuff I had last time. We're now with USB connections still, but they all go cut chunk. The last connections we had were sort of a mm, and when you move the camera or move something around, they were a little bit wonky. But these connections, one, the connection for the mic, for camera one, for camera two, for the ethernet, they are all cut chunk. So I think we're good to go for that stream coming up. Until we won't be. Something will happen, I'm sure. But whatever. Okay, today there's a couple of alternate jobs I could be doing. I think really at the base of it, I will sit with a carving job. We're going to just be seeing more carving today. But before I get to that... I've got to open some stuff and get it off my desk here. We know what this is again already. When did we get one of these? It was just a few days ago, right? Like last Thursday. This guy is the incredible machine. Incredible machine. It's, of course, more prints from kubota -san. Okay, that should be something you guys should then be able to guess. If this is a package from Kubota-san, a thick package of prints, and it has arrived quicker than normal, normally he'll do a job or something every couple of weeks, this job took only a few days. So that should probably tell you what might be inside this box, this package. Anybody? Surfing bunny, no, it's too big for that, John. It's a good guess, because it's only two blocks. That would be a, not a bad guess. No, John didn't get it. It was a good guess, a good try. No, no disrespect. But it was wrong. Lady in Water. No, we didn't get that to go about it. He doesn't want that. <laughs> We've been through that. <laughs> Actually, I haven't sent it to him since we redid the blocks, since we carved a new block. So he maybe he would now be willing to give it another go. But uh, he wasn't very happy with last time. So he doesn't want to see that one again. KG's got it, Lady in Water. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But you're on the right track. Everybody is guessing prints here that have few colors, not so many colors. Small scale and not so many colors. 
what else have we got right now that needs doing right now all the time and that is small scale and has not so many colors? Korigami. Reborn Prince. Reborn Prince. Stack like this. This is not the first group. This series is helping our business so much this year. Dei Chan did the, did the test printing. It's carved by Chon San. So Chon San and Dei Chan built it together. Dei Chan did the first printing, the group that had to be shipped out November 1st to the collectors. She then went ahead and did another batch of 100. So she's done 100 plus 100 for the second group of collectors on the 11th of the month. And Ayana-san yesterday did the, uh, did the building for the third group of collectors on the 21st of the month. Today's the 23rd, so Ome wants these. It's a holiday today. The post office is closed. So my job is they came back yesterday perfectly on time from Kabodasan. Today I have to do the embossing and then send them to Ome tonight so that tomorrow they can be packed and fly out from the post office. But I, I really don't think we need an embossing stream today. Let's look at some carving. And as soon as the stream's over and we pack this up, then I will get busy with the embossing. Someone says, you got yours. This is three blocks. No, it's, uh, I really don't remember if I got. It's the key block, of course. And then there's a gray tradition in the background. There's gray tones. There's some deeper gray on the, the modeled section, the feathers here, which are insane. Chon San has done an insane job on the carving here. I don't know how many blocks. It's four or maybe five. I'm sorry. I don't remember. And there's, of course, there's a Karaziri block. The clouds are done in Karaziri. I know we had to do something careful here. When we got the sketch, when we got the sketch from Hoksai, I was going to say, the Hoksai sketch itself is sort of all one taste and tone. There's two birds, there's a bit of ground, and there was a little curlicue pattern. And at first we just thought, okay, let's just do this. But then we realized what's happening here is this. These are two birds, but they're not two birds. This is a real animal, a peacock. Hooks, I saw this kind of thing. He knows about it. He's planted it on the ground. There it is. It's actually a completely separate print, a completely separate design that they've stuffed onto the same page. This is an imaginary bird. This is, uh, I was going to say it's a firebird, Hinotori. It's not. It's a pheasant. Uh, uh, what's the imaginary bird? Starts with a P. You know, born, born, born in the fire. Man, am I losing it or what? P phoenix, 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 phoenix. It's a phoenix, so it's imaginary. So the, the book that Hoksai was building here is an encyclopedia. And if you think of the books that I had when I was a kid, there'd be a page and there'd be stuff, you know, jammed all over the page. So this is an encyclopedia page. It's not a single picture of two birds that are happy together. We have the actual bird on the ground and we have the phoenix in its imaginary clouds. So he is, the Chonsa and the carver also treated them differently. You'll see when you get your copy, the carving is different, different taste, different mood. So away they go. I will emboss these later this afternoon or later this morning. And they will fly away to uh, Ome tonight on the Takibin service. And tomorrow, the two ladies in Ome will pack them up and send them out. Someone's asking, someone, Tom 1060, someone's asking, is the paper out? It is. Two packs are out today. Ishikawa-san is working on the uh, Castlevania print, not quite finished yet. And Yuki-san is working on the, what we call Tabibito, the two travelers. It's the, the little small print of... Uh, of a Don Quixote and she is knocked it out of the park. I wish I had one here. She called me up there yesterday afternoon. She was about, she, she's done her stack of 40 or 50, they were almost finished and she was trying to add one more color and it wasn't working. So luckily, luckily she's finally learned not to push ahead with this stuff and spoil all 40 prints. 
She called me. I looked at it. said, cancel that color. Stick with what you've got. We're done. It's finished. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful print. Someone's asking about the microphone. There is no mic on my shirt. Uh, the mic at the moment is sitting on the box in front of me. It's left over from when I did the testing with Taran San yesterday. Is the mic okay? It's on the desk in front of me where I don't bang it and where it doesn't pick up stomach rumbles. Okay, let's get going. Let's get going. One more, one more. Okay. You would recognize this, another Tokaido print. We are buying all the Tokaido prints I can possibly find on Yahoo Auctions. And we got lucky last week. I got a small set of Tokaido prints and I was thinking, please, 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 please let a whole bunch of them be foxed. Why would I ask for that? Because when we get sets of prints, our, our, our policy here is, is, uh, is pretty strong. We don't cut books up. We don't break up sets. We uh, keep sets, of course, uh, as a, as a one-piece thing, except when one there's a whole bunch missing, the set is already broken, or two when a, a number of the prints inside the set are damaged or foxed. That allows us to say, okay, thank you very much, history, break up that set. They go as single prints into the shop, so people can enjoy having a Japanese print on their wall. So yesterday we got this set. It was two days ago we got this set. I opened it yesterday, working in the back there with there with the staff. And they look beautiful. Nice, good, nice, good. Check, check, nice, good. And half of Dave is, is happy because it's a nice, beautiful set of prints. And the other half of him is thinking, is frustrated. I need more prints for my shop. What are we going to do here? So we get to this one. Actually, I hadn't seen it. I think it was Marcel San. She opened it and says, Dave, what about this one? And I'm like, looks okay. What do you think? Looks okay. But what she had noticed that I hadn't noticed was this. Get a load of this. Are you ready for this? Now, how does this work? This is another different example of foxing. The foxing has happened not on the print itself, but on the backing sheet and on the front sheet. So you tell me, what's the mechanism that this could work? It's the backing sheet that has become foxed, not the print, but only in the area where the backing sheet has touched the print. And intensively in the area where there is no pigment and very lightly in the area where we have deep pigment. You tell me the mechanism, how this works. I am lost. The usual suspects there, foxing is a fungus, uh, foxing is this, foxing is that. I'm lost. I have no idea. And I'm not even going to put a bed on the table. I have no idea. Simply, this is going to go aside. It's going to go in our research stack. You know, we're building a stack of these things. At some point, somebody in the future who has a requirement for this, this goes into the research stack. We've got just about every possible variation. The paper fox, the backing paper fox, the green not fox, the green fox. We're sort of, it's not random. Everything seems to have a pattern and have a meaning, but they're all in opposition to each other. No idea. Anyway, there you are. One more data point for those of you who care about this sort of stuff. And there were a few more in the deck. So that batch of prints has been separated from its uh, mountings. It's gone up to Watanabe-san and they will be appearing in the shop here later on. And again, with a situation like this, I have no qualms. I'm not doing anything bad at all. That box of prints, which was produced in the 1950s or 60s, sold as a set. When we were opening it yesterday, we could see the last half of the things had never, ever been opened. It was a subscription set. They came three at a time. Somebody must have subscribed. They got the box on the first three prints. Then a couple of weeks later, the next three prints. There were some old invoices and price labels inside, which we also keep for our research. And the first groups, the plastic package had been opened. Someone had looked in the print. And then about halfway down, the plastic packages were not even opened. The guy was getting the subscription prints, paying for them, stuffing them in the box. 
So those prints, perhaps this one right here, I don't know the details of that, has never been opened and looked at since 1962 when it was received by the collector. So I have no hesitation whatsoever about taking a damaged set like that, breaking them apart, putting the prints in the shop. To my mind, we were joking about this with Marcel son yesterday. We're opening these things and the prints are free, free, I'm free at last. <laughs> from 1963. That means I 60 years those pieces of paper have been stuck inside there. So am I, uh, am I guilty about breaking that pack apart and freeing those prints? Not at all. Not at all. We were just laughing about it, cheering. Free, free, oh my God. And then the next joke is, okay, the print's going to get mounted. We can see it. It's in the light. It's in the shop. Then someone's going to pick it up. And you can imagine the prints. They're, they're like, it's like the pets in a, the pet shop or, the, or the, the dogs in the shelter. The people are coming through. Please choose me. Please choose me. You know, where am I going to go to my new home? And the people, you know, a lady from Belgium will pick one up and, and uh, somebody from, from you know, uh, Canada will pick the next one up. And these prints are just going to fly on their overseas journey where they can live for the next hundred years. It's such fun, you know. Choose me, choose me. How are we doing? Oh, still sharp. I sharpened it yesterday. I touched it up last night. Let's get some work done. Where are we going to carve? We're going to carve. We're, we're, well, just so you know, we have been doing, we, I, we, I've been busy on this, you know. I've been busy. We started uh, with the, the hibachi, worked our way through, finished the first character to the top. I then moved on to the next sandal, and I've been chewing away. We're working away at the kimono of the, the long-necked man. It's coming along. Let's find our location. We're doing some kimono pattern here today. We did the dress rehearsal on Tuesday for the upcoming stream, you know, the live print start to finish, myself and Taransan. Taransan is really helping with this. He organized the space. He's got, he got brought an extra carving bench. We got it set up and got the two cameras set up. Taransan is really, really wants to do this. He's really egging me on to do this. But uh, we sat here. I'm on my bench, and Taransan is to my left at an angle, 90 degree angle on his bench. I've got my camera. He's got his camera. And we did a little test run. We didn't broadcast a test run. We, we recorded it, the tape, and did a test. And at one point, he had to zoom in and out on his, uh, his block. So he reaches up to zoom in on his camera. <laughs> I'm just laughing. Pull in, push out. <laughs> and he's got it so. Uh, we've got it now. Uh, when the, the, that stream starts, we are both going to have access to the stream, to, to the chat. I will have my computer in its normal place with the chat. Taransan will have, I think he'll be using an iPad. We tried it yesterday, Tuesday. She has an iPad with the chat. So we will both be here. We will both be visible. We will have an overview of both of us here. Both of our desks will be visible. And we will both have access to chat. So I think we're going to be okay with this. So we'll see, we'll see. We're still, not all the details are refined yet, and I still haven't got a date. Still haven't got a date, but uh, it's going to be soon. We'll let you know. We will let everybody know, don't worry. And we won't let everybody know the night before. We'll be letting you know, like maybe a week in advance, once it's all set. So. It's going to be fun. I myself, I'm a little bit worried about the second system effect, but I uh, can't sweat it. Just get going and do it. Oops, too much junk on the desk.
Yesterday was uh, was so much fun in the shop, you know. It was a booming day. I think it was the second biggest day we've ever had in the shop yesterday. Completely unexpected, just out of the blue, just chain after chain. The people come in, next group comes in, next group comes in. And by the end of the day, it had turned out to be the, I think, the second biggest day we've ever had in terms of, you know, number of prints leaving the shop. And some of the things along the way were funny. It, it doesn't always happen like this. There was a, a family, a young family, a gentleman with his, his wife and a kid, a young, young boy. And they wanted to browse for a while, so we took the boy and threw him in, <laughs> threw him in the back room <laughs> with a puzzle. You know, we've got some kids' puzzles and games and stuff in the back room. And he was a little bit bored, and his dad wanted to browse the prints. So we, we took the young man and threw him in the back room with a, with a puzzle, kept him busy for a while. <laughs> But it turned out it was funny. I was asking the, the, the people, you know, all right, where are you from, what you do? They, they were YouTube viewers. They'd, they knew who we were, who I was, whatever. So whatever, it turned out that, okay, from California, software engineer. No problem. Okay, okay. Not totally uncommon type. So we're chatting about this and about that. And then somebody else in the shop who's browsing there, a gentleman by himself, turns around. I'm from California. I've been watching your videos. I'm also in IT, you know, so, so right there at the shop at the same time, we had two people from the same part of the world working in the same kind of job, we've been watching our YouTube videos. So that sort of tells you something, and obviously our, any given type of work will attract, you know, similar people, I guess. So, so be it. So that specifically is not so rare, but to have them there in the shop at the same time, exactly, and overlapping each other was fine. So that's fine, the first group is done. We chat for a while about uh, his job and about AI. It was funny. You know, he had a, a, a little bit of a connection to the to the drama that's going on this last week in the AI world. You know. So we chatted about that for a while, the, the, the first gentleman. Uh, I don't know how that's all going to play out, but whatever. So the, the news that was happening last weekend in the, in the AI world you know, does affect this gentleman per se. So and then it chained on you know the, the, the first the family left after a while they, they picked up some prints very nice and, and uh, the young boy finished his puzzle and they left so I, I chatted with the next gentleman you know, from, from California and then as he was here a lady came in uh, about somebody about my age I guess a lady about my age came in and it turned out she was from uh, from Europe, from uh, Flanders, I guess the area. And she's been watching YouTube videos, and she chats, and she steps forward and talks for a while, and the, the gentleman from California steps back and browses for a while. And there's this chain, group one, chains to group two, chains to group three. And then while she's talking, another gentleman comes in, starts browsing. I had guessed, before he spoke, I tried to play the guessing game of where you're from. I looked at his haircut and his me, and he stood there looking at me, and I looked at him. And without one word spoken, I, I pointed and said, Britain, Great Britain. No. And then he started speaking, aha, this is going to be Germany. And he too, YouTube viewer watching, and it, the chain went on all afternoon one to the next one to the next and there's this incredible thing you know all these people from from these different parts of the world I mean two of these people were from the same place California but the rest Belgium and then Germany and the next guy was from Canada a couple from Toronto man they bought a ton of prints ouch a bit of embarrassing so many prints and it's really really getting funny for me. I sit here, like right now, as we speak right now, there are airplanes in the air coming towards Japan. There's an airplane coming from Chicago, another airplane coming from uh, Dusseldorf, whatever. At the moment that we speak, there are airplanes on the way to Japan, and people in them are looking at their newspaper, watching a movie, doing this. And in their mind, one of the, they've got their list of things to do in Japan, and one of the things is to come here and chat with Dave. They've seen the YouTube videos. <laughs> And I'm, I'm used to this now because it's happening so much every day. Every day there was maybe, with no exaggeration, 10, I didn't count them, 10, 11 people who came, you know, to, to come here. Right now in the air, on the airplanes, on the way here, are, are 
a bunch of people with the same goal. <laughs> I just, I still can't get used to this. Oh, 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 got a bit of drip here this morning, excuse me. At least with the mic off my chest, I can blow my nose safely. Finland again, there was a gentleman from Finland here yesterday too. So, so. There are people who come to Japan to eat Kit Kats, yes, <laughs> I know. People ask us about that. Where can I get my Kit Kat hits? Another one from Kentucky. Another one. Then we're visiting Terry in Karuizawa. If someone says there's nothing to see in Karuizawa, that's not true. Karuizawa is a beautiful escape day from Tokyo. Hiking, mountains, walking, the little town. Karuizawa is a nice place to visit, you know. The usual question, what do I feel is the most important advice to give to someone looking to learn how to carve and just starting out? We, we've gone over this thing a million times. I can press my button and give my recorded playback here. It doesn't matter. Any piece of wood is fine. Anything to cut a knife is fine. Just explore. Just explore. Don't start something really super complicated. Keep it simple. Absolutely keep it simple. Keep it small scale. Just so that you get a feel for what this is like. If you try to start something like this, it's going to be nothing but disappointment and frustration. Start simple. Maybe don't get sidetracked, Dave. Keep carving, keep carving, keep carving.
you think about the Vancouver episode, there's a couple of things. It's going to get confusing because there's a couple of different things happening, it looks like. In early January, the first week of January, my daughter and her daycare are doing an event. It's, it's nothing to do with me. I won't be there. I have sent her over a set of blocks, and they're going to be doing a little print party event at one of their daycare fundraising things. That's going to happen somewhere in early January. Did she say January 6th? I don't remember. I'm sorry. Don't quote me. I'll let you know once she gives me lots of detail. That will be happening. I won't be part of that event. It'll be a fundraiser for their daycare. They're going to, all the mothers are getting together. They're going to, it's a baking pies or doing this or doing that. And one of the events they're offering to people at, at the fundraiser is there will be a table there with one of our print party block sets. And my daughter and some of her buddies, the other mothers in there, whatever, maybe my other daughter will join. They will be coaching people through making a wood block print in a print party style like we used to do here at uh, at Mokohankan. The block set she's got is the one with the cherry blossom, the old man standing in the tree throwing the ashes and they become a big cloud of cherry blossoms. That's the first event with my daughter. That'll be happening in the first week of January. I won't be there. The second plan, still totally to be built up, is sometime in February I will go over there for my normal family holiday, meet my kids, meet my grandchildren, all that kind of stuff. And while I'm there, it looks like there's plans cooking that I could do some kind of event. I'll take some wood blocks with me, take some stuff with me, and maybe for an hour and a half or something like this in some place, maybe it's part of her daycare or not, I don't know. I'll show some wood blocks, maybe I'll print something for demonstration, talk, 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 chat, and then we'll take a coffee break, and then print party blocks go on the table, and the people who've attended the event line up and come through, bang, 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 bang. Hey, look at that one, that's a good one. Oh, oof, didn't, go. you know, whatever. We'll have an event. Dave's little talk demonstration, plus coffee break, plus you can make your own print, you know, line up and make your own print. And that would be somewhere in February time and place to be undecided. Now I do these sorts of things, I used to do them all the time, and normally I would, there would be no money involved whatsoever. But again, this is under the auspices of a new daycare that my daughter is involved in for, for her kids and the kids of all their friends. It's a fundraiser for them. So what we would do is, although I'm not gonna charge people to come and see me, we'd probably do a, what do you do, a, a tip jar for the daycare or something, or, or I don't know, whatever, that, that one is still cooking. Anyway, that's still cooking. So it's two separate events. One is going to be happening, I think it's January 6th, so I'll let you know. I won't be there for that one. And then the other one, it'll be, you know, spend an hour or so with Dave and listen to the, the, the see the little demonstration and then make your own print. And that will be sometime in February, date to be undecided. This would all be happening, of course, in Vancouver, Canada. My daughter said, she mentioned, I don't know how much of this is, is whatever, she said uh, among the people on their board of directors at the daycare, she said there's somebody I think who works at, at the University of British Columbia in the, in the Asian studies there. I think this person she mentioned was interested in maybe this event would happen out there in the, the library at the Asian Studies Center. I think that was one idea that was on the table, I don't know. It's funny because I remember in the time when I lived in Vancouver before coming here, when coming to Japan was still just a, maybe not even a dream that had been started, when I was working in Vancouver, and maybe after my first kid was born, maybe somewhere, I was already exploring making Japanese prints. And there's no internet, I had no books about this stuff, there was nothing available to, to show me what's going on. So I, one day I went out to the library at the Asian Studies, I think it's called the Asian Studies Centre? Or the, I don't know, something. Anyway, there's an Asian studies blah, blah, blah place at the University of British Columbia. And back then, I think it was fairly new. There was a beautiful new building there. There was a, there was a library there. Whatever. So I look through the card catalog, tut, 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 and I find two items. Japanese woodblock prints. A set of Japanese woodblock prints. Two of them created by the Adachi Company here in Tokyo. At that time, I wouldn't even have known anything about them. I, I would probably not even have heard of them. So I, I go to the desk, I don't even remember the details, so I go to the desk and make a request to see these items. The lady took down the, you know, the card catalog number, whatever that I had given her. 
And uh, X, X minutes later, she comes out from the back with uh, this fairly substantial thing. And there's two sets of Japanese prints, maybe a set of 10 and a set of 20, whatever, I don't remember, made by the Adachi company. Wow! Wow! They, she's, there's the table here. You can have a look, go and sit at this table and, and browse these prints, you know. So Davis just, my God, oh my God, an actual chance to see a whole bunch of real Japanese prints made by this magical Adachi company that maybe I've heard of, whatever. So I take the prints over the table, get the box, you know, roll up, whatever, follow the rules, no pencils, whatever. I open the cover, open the one inside, and oh my God, foxing, top to bottom, not just a dot here, a dot there, a dot there. You turn the thing, and it's all you can see is brown foxing. I turn to the next one, boom, turn to the next one, boom, put it away, open the next set, boom, there's nothing. It's 100% foxed. Call the lady over, you know, like, I didn't do this, I didn't do this, I'm innocent, whatever. She says, oh my God, or whatever, you know. They consult, whatever, blah, 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 blah. They take them away. That's the end of that. <laughs> so, and this would have been 1982, 1983, somewhere on there, early 1980s. So those, those sets. And I learned later about this, not about the foxing, but I learned later about Adachi. Adachi, as part of their struggle to stay alive through the, those years, 1960s, 70s, 80s, whatever, as part of their, their business model, they got tons of money from the Japanese Culture Ministry and the Japanese Foreign Ministry for the preservation and, and dissemination of Japanese woodblock prints, you know, whatever. And they did. They had a deal where they, they were paid by the, I guess it was the foreign ministry, I don't know, it might have been the, the culture ministry, I don't know. And they made these sets of prints and the government, Japanese government paid Adachi for them and they were sent to, as we see, uh, embassies and libraries and places all around the world where there was some reason for, for Japanese cultural things to be, to be uh, done. So I guess the Asian Studies Library at UBC was a target place and Adachi was paid to, to send them these sets. And at that time, they couldn't have been all that old. This I was looking at them there. This was in the early 1980s. And the prints must have been made in, well, I don't know. They could have been made anywhere. S not the 60s, probably 70s. So they wouldn't have been all that old. And they were foxed top to bottom. So anybody, and if anybody here on this stream is, is involved with this, the, the Asian Studies Library at UBC, if they still have those things, or if they've been burned long ago, or, or what, I don't know. But at that time, there were two sets of, of Adachi prints. And I'm sure in that environment, in the university library, they must have been cared for properly. It wasn't like left in a damp room or something, you know, of course. Okay, how's our time? I know the schedule today actually is going to be a little bit different from normal. I'm not sure those of you who know what's going on. Today's Thursday, and normally on Thursdays, we do this stream around 9 o'clock or so. Aino san will you know, frequently pop her nose in the door. That's not going to happen today. She's not here today. And I didn't swim today. It's a bit of a different day. It turns out today, Thursday, is a national holiday here in Japan. I don't swim on national holidays. Not for any specific reason other than that my pool pass is for normal days only. So when it's weekends or holidays, uh, they don't do a morning session at the pool. They open at 9.30 instead of 7. So I don't swim on holidays. And the staff upstairs will not be here today. The shop is open as normal. The shop and tourists don't care about it being a holiday. But our office staff upstairs is not here. So Ayn-san will not be 
dropping in around 9 o'clock today. There will be a show and tell. It's not something old from upstairs. We're going to do a package opening. A package arrived yesterday. I know what's inside and we'll have a look at it. It's some prints that are interesting. And it's the same kind of thing we are talking about before, earlier in this stream. It's a broken set. And we knew it was broken from the beginning. The, the person who put it up on auction said, Zanen Nagara. Broken set of prints. And when the uh, auction sellers do that, I'm always happy because the prices don't go so high for broken sets. So it's a, it's a win-win for me. The prices are not so high, and we have no no uh, problem with our conscience about uh, breaking these things up. So. so we'll see what that is today in the short term time. You're talking about foxing. Did anyone check if it's iron related? I myself, I'm not the guy to ask. I'm not doing any research on this foxing, so I'm really sorry. I'm not. I'm a source of raw data here, but I know nothing about the science. I, you know, as I said, there's theories that it's X mold, X fungus, X chemical. I just do not know. I'm sorry. I've read a little bit here and there. Various museum people that have come in. Capuchin was talking a lot to me about it. The British Museum people, what their theories are. So I'm sorry, I, I really don't know. I really don't know. Oh, Sensei Martian is, is here talking. I haven't been following, you know, I'm really, really sorry. It's been extremely busy. Is, is, uh, is he here this morning or is he up and running already? I don't know. I haven't been following day by day. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, uh, if he's up and running, should we do? Should we, I know, be be raiding again at the end of the stream? Remind me. Talk about this at the end of the stream. If he's up and running and walking, and we should be raiding, let me know. I don't even know where he is right now. I'm sorry. I'm totally out of touch. Totally out of touch with it. So, British Museum, have they released that other video? I keep watching every couple of days, and I'm just waiting for it to drop. I don't have any inside information. They asked us for some extra footage. We supplied. This was weeks and weeks and weeks ago. The young man who is their editor said, any minute now, we're going to be putting these up. There's two videos related to me coming on the British Museum website. One is sort of part two from their visit here last spring. And one is an update on their curator's corner. And a longer video, which I will be just one tiny part of, because it features everybody who was in their curator's corner over the last year. And I, I had been expecting that both of those were going to drop any minute now, and that was weeks ago. So I don't know. I don't have an inside track. And I'm not going to bug them. Hey, where's the video? Because I know what it's like to have people call you and say, where's the video? <laughs> so all I can suggest is let's just keep watching.
This video for the British Museum was so much fun. They asked us for some extra footage. And I don't know, you know, I can't describe it, whatever. They asked us for some extra footage. And Ayano-san and I, together with Taran-san, we talked about this a bit. Taran-san filmed it. And me and Ayano, we did some stuff here and sent it off to them. And it hasn't been shown yet. So uh, who knows? Maybe we screwed up. I don't know. So much chat. I'm sorry. I can't see half of this. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. Look at this, look at how this comes out. Love. I love you. Darling, don't. They're all gonna find out. Shh. Foxing, foxing, Terry McKenna. How this kind of creative work can be turned into a business? Can I shed some light or share any tips? What's the main source of income of my workshop? Oh my God. All I can say at this point, I'm sorry, go, go back in our history here. Look at our blogs, look at our video. It's a massive story. What is the main source of income? We have 30 people working here. This is actually not a little workshop anymore, I'm sorry. This is actually now uh, quite a, a, it's a big little business. We have 30 people working here. You know, at the beginning, whatever, I, I don't even know what to say. Look back in the, in the, on our video channel. There's a couple of videos, beginnings, part one, part two. The story is too long to quickly summarize here. I'm sorry if I'm if I'm blowing off your comment. It's just a massive, massive thing to talk about, and uh, most of the people here who have been following for quite some time, they know the details. They know how how it's worked. And I can't easily encapsulate the whole story again here. Get to the website. Go to the woodblock.com website. There's a section there where I've been, where I'm going. It's horribly out of date, but it will fill you in on the questions you're asking there. You know. But the, the, the overall question, how can I turn my, my love for something into a way to make a living? Well, it's, it's uh, planning, coming up with ideas, and an endless, insane amount of hard work to make it happen. And then it, when it does get there, you might find that uh, you have to be careful what you wish for, because uh, you might get it. What I'm referring to there, of course, is that Dave now, the amount of time I actually get to make prints is uh, extremely reduced compared to when I was a solo craftsman. I used to spend all day every day happily making prints. That uh, really doesn't happen so much anymore. You're just seeing here right now a few minutes snatched from my time from the rest of the day. Being the operator of a, a million and a half, our revenue this year will be just about a million and a half if you look at it in US dollars. 30 employees. You really have to wonder if, if this is what you want, you know. Anyway, a huge long topic that just can't be encapsulated in a, in a short little thing here, I'm sorry. Go back in the websites and uh, dig around. Lots of information there about this. Are we okay for time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Coming up to nine o'clock. I feel like it's a Saturday because it's a holiday. It's nine o'clock on a Saturday, but it's not. It's a normal weekday. Well, a holiday weekday. In Japan, the holiday here, uh, it's a national holiday, but over and above that, here in Asakusa, it's actually a local holiday. It's what you call Tori no Ichi. Now, literally, it's sort of whatever the market of the bird would be, the, the word, the translations of the word. It's an old shrine. It's connected with one of the shrines here, and it's sort of a shrine, not a festival. It's a shrine. Well, it's sort of a festival, I don't know. It's not a festival, it's not a market, it's a mix of the two. I don't, if you've heard about the Japanese traditional called ku, I was going to say mukade, I got my ku, ku, kumade, rake. There's a Japanese shrine tradition where the shrine people, you, you make a donation and they give you a little rake. It's a decorated rake with like money bags and fish, bream, tai, 
and you know, like good fortune. So you, you make a donation to the shrine and you pray to the gods to what you do. And they give you a little rake and you hang it up in your home or workshop or whatever. And of course, the idea, it's, this is a no-brainer, it's a symbol that rakes in money and good fortune. It's a shrine up the street that does this. And there's, some years it's two days, some years it's three. Tori Nuichi, it's based on some old lunar calendar or something. And there's, it happens three times uh, in November. It's when, when the lunar thing falls three times or two times. This year there's only two. It's the 11th and the 23rd. My birthday, November 11th, and my sister's birthday, November 23rd, today. And so that's the Tori Noichi. And today is uh, Nino Tori, the second one. My birthday last week was Ichino Tori. <laughs> and uh, there's a twist. I think we talked about this. You know, so the deal is after you get your rake, and then a year later... Uh, it's finished, you, you burn it, or you, maybe you take it back to the shrine, they burn it there, they've got a big pile where you burn last year's rakes and stuff, and you buy another one. And the rule is, the new one must be, because you've raked in goodness, it worked last year, so you're now bigger, you must buy a bigger rake this year. It's the deal that they, you know, the cynical deal that they invented all those years ago. And over at the shrine there, they have some massive rakes. And if you're if you're Toyota, you have to come here and sponsor this. And you need six guys to carry your rake down the street, whatever. <laughs> they we're all ignoring the idea that Japan these days, it's all about uh, SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. And I don't think that shrine understands this. And they're not going to talk about this. Next year, bigger. Next year, more. More money, more profit. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Destroy the planet. So I don't know how that old uh, shrine ethic survives in, in these days. It's a, so someone said it's a pyramid scheme, whatever. So my nose is running. It is. I'm sorry. Nothing I can do about it. I can sit here and blow my nose all day long. But uh, that's one reason why I took the mic off my chest today. We don't have a rake here. I don't. I try and avoid, you know... I try and avoid being a hypocrite. We do take our donation to Hokusai's grave, so, you know, it's a bit silly. But I really don't go in for most of this shrine stuff. So. But just a warning, if you're here and if you're ever around here, when you're buying your first rake, be careful. Buy the smallest one you can find to start with. And those two words, they're, they're scrambled in my mind. Kumade and mukade. Mukade, centipede. We're not buying centipedes here. So today, uh, all down the street, uh, as we're watching during the day here, we will see any number of people outside walking by with these rakes. Because part of the deal is the, the shrine where you pick this up, it's up the street, up Koksai Dori. It's about a kilometer and a half or so north of here. And then after people visit the shrine and uh, buy their rake and have a bit of sake, they will then very commonly head to a saksa for, you know, um, a drink or two, a tipple, whatever, or also to head to Sensochi Temple. So we see lots of people outside our shop today coming by with a rake. Nearly always business people, you know, shop owners or people who work in a business or, or whatever, some team inside a business. I'm sure it's Googleable if you if you Google images. Uh, uh, Japan Tori no Ichi. These, uh, no, you know, the, the, you really can't help but be cynical about this. You know, some time X hundreds of years ago, some people in the temple or a shrine. I mean, how much of this is organic tradition and how much of this is connived you know we got to figure out a way to people bring people to our shrine was it actually shrine guys think what if we made what if we did this let's have an idea where we sell rakes and blah 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 and then somebody says how about we had a rule where it's got to be bigger you know how much of this is cynical set up by the shrines to get money 
and how much of it is something it just happened organically out of a tradition and there's nothing really evil or bent or you know or, or you know about it at all I don't know of course I don't know this is all long 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 lost but I really can't help but personally take the cynical viewpoint this is a bunch of guys in a shrine at some point trying to think about how they can how they can swing more money you know And given that history, there was an episode, oh, this goes back years and years and years. This must go back, I was going to say 30 years. It's quite possible it's 30 years. In the Japan Times, Japan Times used to be a different kind of newspaper. Now it's part of a larger organization. But Japan Times used to be an independent newspaper here, which I read because it gave, gave lots of good information on Japanese society that wasn't, uh, they, they could talk about stuff that the normal newspapers couldn't talk about. So I subscribed to both. I subscribed to the Japan Times. And then I did three. I did the Daily Yomayuri for the conservative point of view. And I did the Asahi Daily News for the sort of basically lefty point of view. It's all changed now, but whatever. Anyway, those are gone. But I remember an episode in the Japan Times, and this would be easily 30 plus years ago. A, a foreigner, guy, guy just like me at the time, he'd probably been living in Japan one, two, three years, whatever. He talked about this in, in, I guess he had a regular column in the newspaper once a month. I don't even remember his name. And in his column at one point, it must have been towards December, towards the end of the year, whatever, he talked about this idea that these shrine festivals or go to Sensoji, you put your, your five yen coin in and more because goen, fate, luck, the, the coincidence of the words and stuff like this. You know. Anyway, he said a lot of this is cynical. He just says, like I just mentioned, he says, okay, given that, okay, let's bring this forward and let's start a new one. And this, this foreign, he said, let's start a new uh, quasi-religious, quasi-customary, quasi-seasonal thing. If we start it now, and if we can, you know, make this happen, it, it, it might fail and die. But if it rolls, if it starts to go, then we've got a good thing going here. So what he did was, he said, let's make this new phrase called Hatsu Gaijin. Now, we have in Japan a lot of things about the new year. There's Hatsu Yume. You're supposed to, you know, the, put the things under your pillow and the first dream of the new year, I forget the details. If you dream about eggplant, I can't remember because I'm not such a good uh, knowledgeable about all these twists of Japanese culture. Pardon me, in, in your Hatsu Yume, if you dream about eggplant, and I think another one is Mount Fuji or whatever, then these things are auspicious moments and you will have good fortune for that year. So his idea was, let's do this. Let's have Hatsu Gaijin. Hatsu is the first Gaijin is, you know, foreigner here in Japan. And he wants to start. In January 1st or 2nd or 3rd, people that are going around town, they've gone to the shrine to give their obeisance. They're just going around town doing shopping. The first foreigner they meet becomes Hatsu Gaijin. And you have to say to this foreigner, Ah, Hatsu Gaijin desu ne, omedetou gozaimasu. And you give the Gaijin, like, whatever, 10 yen or 100 yen or a paper money if you're feeding up to it, whatever. And the Gaijin blesses you. He just says, Ya, omedetou gozaimasu, kotoshi mo yoroshiku onegaishimasu. Or something like this. Just make up these phrases. And he tried. He said, Let's do this this year. Let's get this going. Let's get this going. And if it could become a thing, then, oh my God, oh my God, all of us who live here in Japan, out January 1st, 2nd, 3rd, we get out there and we stroll around with a money bag in our pocket to just, just scoop this, you know. <laughs> so, I, I, it obviously didn't happen because here we are 30 years later and as far as I know, it hasn't become a thing. But uh, there it is. That one didn't take off, but uh, I mean, I'm, of course, I'm laughing about this. I can't imagine. <laughs> you know? But that's the viewpoint that these shrine traditions were cynical connivances to try and get more money for the shrine. I don't know. How do I know? Hatsugaijin. Maybe we should give it another kick at the can. Now that I have some good, uh, good uh, social media here. Dave, be careful what you wish for in case you get it. I wonder if that stuff's online. If you Google Hatsugaiji, do you get any results? Was there, was there discussion about it?
I think in the story when he was presenting this, it was how serious it was or how much of a joke, I don't know. But in the story when he was presenting this, of course, he, he, he then mentioned that, of course, if this becomes a thing, then uh, the place to go, you've got to stand outside Meiji Jingu or stand outside Sensoji on January 1st and 2nd, where, you know, there are like five million people trooping by all in the first day of the year, you know. And there would be fights among the foreigners to get the positions and who's going to stand in front of the shrine gate and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> Where should we go next here? Let's, let's hit this group here. <laughs> Only in Japan. This thing I'm doing now, I don't think Taran san does this. We'll see when we're comparing his carving and my carving, this event that's coming up. One of the really cool things about this upcoming event is that you can see the difference between the way Dave does carving and the way he organizes his work and the way that Taran san will organize his work. In, in Dave's case here, he wants to carve these bunch of tut 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 So first thing I've done is I've cleared around them to clear an empty space, digging out with a chisel. And now I can go back, in my mind, I can go back carefully and shave off these edges. Because now that the waste wood is gone, I can shave off the edge here. And there's no stress from this. There's so little wood against it. If that, if that wood was still here, we'd be squeezing the knife. But because the waste is gone, I can slice this off. And I do this, well, whatever you've been watching, you've seen me do this all, all over the place all the time. And I don't think Taran san will be doing it this way. So you can see, it'll be many, many, many different details about he and I do the work. One obvious one, we've talked about this many times already, one obvious one is how often I, I rotate the block compared with Taransan. He won't be rotating the block anywhere near as much as I do. So that upcoming stream where he and I are carving together is going to be really, really, really eye-opening and interesting. And I've already showed the mods here, a mock-up of how it's going to work. And the idea is there will be a split screen. In the middle of the screen at the top, something like this. I don't have an example to show you right now. But uh, in the middle of the screen, that picture will be up at the top and it will show both of us. It'll be a distant camera, me on the left, him on the right, and we'll be talking invisible in this stream. Then on the one side, this, the, below that will be a split screen. And you can see, for example, my, my thing will be over here. I'll probably be on the left. And then the other side, on the other side of the screen will be Taransan. So you'll see the two of us carving knives back and forth with the overview in the middle. And then we have scenes set up where this, if I'm on a break for a second, he's doing something interesting, we'll change the scene and the full view comes to his block. And then back and forth, we'll change the scene again and for a minute he'll be out of the view and the full view will be my block. So we'll be able to mix it up back and forth as the, uh, as the thing goes on. The knives I'm using, are they the ones received from Ito Susuma's daughter? It was, for him, it was his wife that I received them. No, his knives are tucked away. I don't use them in daily life. We can't. The knives disappear. I received those knives in 1999, and we're now talking about 24 years. If I had used it, it would have been gone that year. I cannot use his knives. They, knives are consumable objects. Knife blades are consumables. You use it, sharpen it, use it, sharpen it, and it disappears. So absolutely no, I do not, I'm not going to use those knives. But having mentioned this, his daughter, I mean, I received the knives from Ito-san's widow. She is 
you know, long, long gone. His daughter and granddaughter came in the other day. They were in, I think they'd been to Torinoichi, the first one. They stopped here by on the way home to say hello. I didn't recognize her at first. She had to let me know who she was. Ito san musume desu. Oh my God. Hello again. And I got her phone number here. I'm not going to show it to you. Ito san's, Ito -san's daughter's phone number here because I had a uh, little bit lost track of her, but I want to do part three of that video. The Remembering a Carver video, part one is done and up. We have the, uh, it's not the, what is it called? It's the, uh, what do you call it when there's a second version of something? Not an update. I forget, but it's on, it's on our YouTube channel. And then, yes, yeah, sequel. The sequel is there. Thank you very much. And I will now want to do the epilogue. I have it all planned. And I asked her the other day when she was here, okay, here's the idea. I really want to do an epilogue. I want to do this and this and this and show that thing and show this thing. Are you on board with this? And she said, yes. When, 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 when. Not a remake, an epilogue. So we'll have the Remembering a Carver, the sequel, and the epilogue. And that will finish it. That will finish it. When, 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 when. Some of those stories might be difficult. I know I'll have to check with her first, you know, before we actually start rolling the cameras. I've got to tear up tee up with her about some of the things I would want to ask. And I'm quite willing to understand that she may say, Dave, let's let's not go there. Let's not talk about that, please. So we'll see. We, we will have an interesting session. Whatever comes up, it will be interesting. There are many, many things we can talk about. But there are some things that uh, I'm thinking already she will say, look, please, we don't need to go there. There was, at the time, there was a war. Not all stories have to be actually told. Are we at, uh, oh, we're here, 915. It's show and tell time. It's show and tell time. Okay, you guys are talking about food.
Okay, just so you know, that's where we've come. We're moving quite along, this second man. Today in the shop, after I do the embossing on those prints I showed you, I will come back here. So next time you see me, today's Thursday, I'll be back on this on Saturday. Mm. We'll see how far we get on Saturday, or not. Saturday might be a bit of a different story. Let's we'll see, we'll talk about it then. Okay, let's zoom out, let's do our show and tell. Now I have a bit of a problem here because today's box to open is big. It's big, it's big, it's big. We've got to temporarily get this down. I'm gonna to have to move the flask and I have to get up because the box is on the floor. So one second and I will bring you show and tell. And the, as usual, the countdown. How many layers? Usho! Flask. Oh, let's take it out of the way. Come on, Dave. We can't put, well, let's put it in the garbage. That'll hold it. Okay. okay. Box. Oh, my back out. Okay, let's do this thing. If only I had a knife. I think I'm safe now because I think our connections are strong. I can dig in here without banging the camera. Look at that. Okay, so single print in the box and 85 layers. I have no idea. Let's get in here. counting meanwhile tomorrow The deal about this shipping on these auctions is the, the sellers are paranoid that people are going to complain about damage. So always, it's, it's part of the Japanese wrapping, the overwrapping thing to start with, but it's also the sellers want to make sure it's rock solid. Nope, it was packed okay. If there's problems, you're on your own. You know, they really, really, really want to make it clear. Because I think it was one, two, three layers. This is the product itself. You can't count this as the packaging. So I think it was three, that little stuff on top didn't count. Can you read it? Let's do a 
let's move this. This is just going to be in the way. Fugaku Sanju Rokke. It reads the 36 views of Mount Fuji. And the top one says number two, three. We're already. What, 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 what? Oh, it's Urugawa san. Good morning, good morning. Hey, just in time. We just got this set of prints. We're opening for show and tell here. And it's, of course, it's Fugaku Sanju Rokke. But what's the first two characters here? That's show, right? So small, small. Oh, something. Fukaku Sanji Roke. Oh no, they're slightly. The prints are normal size prints. I don't understand what we're talking about. Are you sure that these are like normal size? I thought they were normal size. We'll see in a minute. So you're thinking it's What's reduced like, yeah, size? Reduced size. Shukusho. Shuku, 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 that's what it says. So I don't get this at all. Sorry. I, sh I should know this because this set is a very common set. So. They're normal size prints, you know. Yeah. 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 It's Hokusai. It's the 36 views of Mount Fuji, of course. And we have inside the labels, we have the normal thing. It's This is Fugaku, Fugaku, I know the Fuji views, 36 Sanju Dokke, 36 views. And then each one has the specific location. And this has been around for a while. And I'm not really sure. The, the, the uh, no, auction seller, he showed a few pictures of it and then he made lots of comments like, you're on your own. Look at the pictures carefully and bid as you want to bid. So this set has been around. This has been here for a day or two. It's not a full set, so you know where this is going. We are going to bust this up. Let's see what kind of condition we've got. Now this packaging, this is interesting. This packaging is all done with washi paper. It's a stiff washi. So these guys have gone to some some uh, they've gone to some good effort to make sure these prints were protected properly. Most of the stuff we see, the prints are just wrapped in a god awful paper. These are okay, and I'm hoping that even though the packaging looks terrible, these are nice. These are nice. They're from Takamizawa at a time where they still cared about doing good prints. This is the Takamizawa stamp. Udugawa san, you got something for me? Um, are you sure that that's a set? Oh, it's a broken set. They're okay, not all here. That's what it, I think it's show him. Yeah, partial. Partial. Partial Fugaku Sanji. Yeah, that's, yes, that's what it is. Okay, it's, I saw it's just characters. I don't know. We'll see. It's nice work. Look, clean, good, beautiful gradations, no dots of water in here. Look at the Ichimoji Bokashi. Look at this. Clean, smooth, and beautiful. Wonderful. Very happy. And doubly, triply happy because these prints will now be over, will they be able to go out to good homes. Let's see. We can't look at them all here. That's one, that's two. Let's go through a selection of them. But my God, the packaging is in bad condition. Oh, look at this. Very, very nicely made. It's so common to get poor quality prints. You know, the Tokaido prints that were made so many, the Fuji prints so many. This is a set. I'm wondering if maybe somebody else that I know might... Uh, <laughs> Good morning, Ken-san. Look at this. Very nice. Very nice. But my God, my God, my God. Oh, oh, oh. oh. I think uh, Mieta san's coming oh. today. So take your son off because of the holiday. Yes, very happy. Very happy. These are decent prints, very carved nicely. The 
this is funny. This this particular print, you know, this is funny. One of the earliest things that I learned about Japanese woodblock prints was reading a book by James Michener called uh, The Floating World. James, you know, James Michener, the, the, the famous novelist, he was very, very interested in Japanese woodblock prints, uh, studied a huge amount about it, put out some very, very interesting books about it. And one of the books he put out, The Floating World, it's been heavily, heavily criticized by academia because he got facts and figures wrong. He made up a lot of stuff. But wait, well, his style was to get people interested in it. And I got really interested because of the stuff that he wrote, and here I am. So, but he also, at one point, he was describing this print. And he used it to make an interesting point, what he thought was an interesting point. He was talking about Hokusai and the realism and lack of realism. Like Mount Fuji, that's actually not the shape of the mountain. Mount Fuji isn't that big of a peak. Mount Fuji is a more restful mountain. Now it's majestic, it's as majestic as they come, but he distorted it in all of these things. It's distorted to make it look more whatever, more hoksai. But Michener used this as an example of how hoksai was allowed to distort reality for artistic effects. And here's what he told about this print. He said, these two men are cross-cutting a long beam. Now, whether the beam really was standing up at this angle or not, we don't know. That's another story. I can't take a thing. But he said, in order to make the composition more interesting, he took the two men who were cross-cutting this thing, and he ignored, he cut the saw. This is Michener's description. He ignored reality. He left one man there and one man here, even though they're supposed to be, in Michener's description, even though they're supposed to be cross-cutting this thing. And when I read his description, I thought, okay, okay, it sounds good, this is Hokusai, blah, blah, blah. The years rolled by, we came to Japan, we stayed summertime up in the family farm, where my, my kid's mother, her, she grew up on a farm in the backwoods of Miyaken, and there was a little barn on the property. Not a barn in the sense of an American barn raising barn, but whatever, a barn. They had an ox in there to do some of the work in the paddies, and blah, blah, blah. And there were some old tools lying around. And hanging on the wall there, was a Japanese cross-cut saw, which is not anything like a Western cross-cut saw with a big handle on each end and two men rub it back and forth. What you're seeing is the saw. It's got one handle, it's got a square end on this, it tapers, it's about that long. So this guy is using his saw, chup, 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 and this guy, the guy underneath, the job I would not want for the sawdust, is using his saw. So Michener was full of crap. He didn't know what he was talking about at that point. It's not a Western cross-cut saw. It's two normal Japanese workers using a normal cross-cut saw in Japan. Whatever. Episode, episode, episode. His point was valid. Hokusai changes things and distorts things for artistic effect. I get that. But that particular example he used was... Mm, whatever, whatever, whatever. The guy left a big effect on me. Ah, so, 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 I'm sorry. Okay, okay, okay. Dave, Dave's using the word crosscut here. I'm sorry. These are actually rip saws. I'm sorry. I got it. I got it. I stand corrected. Thank you. My apologies. Man, these are nice. Man, these are nice. Ooh. These, when do they date to? What's going to be the date on these? No way these are the 80s. These are 70s at latest, and I would think earlier. If I was going to have to bet my life on one specific date here, I would put this at mid-1960s would be where I would put my money on the table on these. Possible it could be into the 70s. I don't think they were using this kind of packaging in the 50s. No way. No way it's 80s. So we're looking at Takamizawa at the top. Oh! We're looking at Takamizawa at the top of their post-war form.
Ooh, it's got a bit crumpled up. This is going to be fun. I... Someone says, how, oh, it's John, how is this still in the broken set? John, did you see we started with number two? What's missing is the first one. So somebody got the first one, put it in a frame, that's the broken one. Here's Takamizawa's version. Look at this. This is really, really, you can see the difference. Look at this. All the 20th century ones have gone with the sky, the ghost in the sky. Dave has kept this light. This is not a bad one. My God, we get some that are so much worse than this. They have, uh, this is interesting, they've gone with more gray in the sky. They've got a good gradation behind the mountain. They've also gone with more gray in the sky to bring more of this foam up. I myself, I kept that gray a bit lighter. This is my instructions to our printers, for better or for worse. This is a good one, you know. There are some terrible, terrible reproductions out there. This one, I'm not ashamed of this one at all. These guys have done a good job. Takamizawa, we're at, we're at it. They were good, you know. I'm not in love with the shades of blue they used, but whatever. That's that's uh, that's editor's editorial decision. You know. Nothing on the backing paper, which is washy. Everything on the print itself. Look at this. Look at this. Again, I can only mumble the same things. This one clearly was not instigated by the backing paper. It came from the washi. Look at this, the place where we have deep, rich blue pigment has no foxing front or back. The pigment has protected it or stopped it. It's right to the edge of the paper. Did this come from the sizing? Did it come from the paper manufacturer? This print has it, the next prints don't. When a publisher gets a batch of paper from the manufacturer, we get a batch of paper, bang! Look at this, nothing down here in the corner. It looks like a locust attacking Edo, I don't know. Recently, this stream has become all about foxing. I don't know. Why this one and not the next one? Is it the sizing? Dave's, if I had to blindly, remember I'm a blind man here, but if I was blindly guessing, I would guess it's sizing. The paper used for these prints, most of the paper for the Takamizawa and the Adachi and all the other stuff comes from the same people that we find Adachi prints more often foxed than Takamizawa prints. But here's an example, Takamizawa, strong sizing. This is very, very unusual. I did not expect to see that at all. At all. Someone's saying oxidization. I think that's a low, low on the, you uh, know, on the uh, suspect list. Look at this one. Look at this. There's your package. Does that look familiar? Here's the back side, the washi, that was inside it. When we open up the print, let's move that out of the way. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. There's the print. 
nothing on the print's backboard, nothing. You close this, pick this up, and look at that. Come on. Come on. You can see the mountain. You can see where the gradation was. This is the outside packaging. I think Ken is stepping on the camera cable outside. Ken sound, you're stepping on a cable, I think. Uh, no, I'm not. Well, it's all gone fritzy, the outside camera. So. I'm sorry. It's okay, whatever. We're shutting down in a moment anyway. Well, this one we're keeping for research. It's too bad because I want this print in the shop, but there's no way I have to keep this example. There's no way whatsoever. Look at that. Anyway, there we are. There we are. There we are. Okay, <laughs> all right. That's enough. We've run over time. We've seen some interesting stuff. <coughs> we're being attacked by, uh, by aliens outside on the camera. So there's no point really putting that camera on. <laughs> Let's get out of here. I'll see you two more days. Saturday morning. See you two more. Let's, let's shut this off. It's bizarre. <clears throat> I'll see you two more days from now, Saturday morning. Oh, raid sensei margin. Okay, okay. Remind me again, I'm sorry, how to do this as we say goodbye. Remind me, please. Backslash, backslash raid. And then just his name, right? Sensei underline margin. Is that it? Let's send him over. I don't know where he is. Somewhere on the Tokaido. See you later. See you in a couple more days. Let's go see Sensei Martian. It's going to count down. Nine, seven, six, four, three, two, one. It now says raid now. I'll see you and then I'll shut down my stream. Thank you very much. Bye for now.